I mean, in Genesis, when God created male and female, he says like created male and female and he made them in his image. And in being in his image, they were very distinct from the plants, um, from the animals, from the sky and the stars. Like none of these things were created in God's image. Um, I think, and that's crazy that God is saying that we, we are, we've been given the ability to mirror him in ways that other inanimate objects are unable to do, such as we can speak and have conversations and have intellectual conversations. We can create things. I mean, I'm an artist. God is the ultimate artist, but that is me mirroring him even in how I'm able to create poems. You know what I'm saying? Or, um, a father's love for their child or a mother's love for their child. It's like we're mirroring God. And so it's like being made in the image of God is something to honor and take serious. So when you have the audacity to take somebody's life, it's like you're not just taking a plant's life, which isn't murder. You're not just, uh, if you had the possibility to take a star out of the sky, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, there's no commands against that type of stuff because it's not made in the image of God. But when you kill a person made in his image, you're coming against God. You know what I'm saying? So I think when people having these conversations about Alton and Philando and all these people, it's like they label them all of these names, criminal cd player seller person and would they forget the way of he was made in god's image y'all foundationally he's that and so if i feel like if people zeroed in on that more than the list of things that they might or might not have done throughout their life then i think they would grieve more because then you would see that that hurts god's heart because he was made in god's image um yeah so that's what i meant by that tweet I think if you look at social justice in the sense of me loving people who are oppressed, then you would see that Jesus did that. You see that God consistently did that throughout the Old Testament, even to the point that he would uh, well, rebuke nations and people who were not walking in justice. Even in Micah 6, 8, it's like, yeah, you're doing all this stuff, but you're not loving kindness. You're not walking humbly and you're not doing justly. It's like God wants us, if anybody should be living their life for the service and honor and dignity of another, it should be Christians. And I think the world has done a better job at social justice than we have. And I think because we have gotten to this, this idea that theology it should not express itself in doxology or that we can know all of these things, but it shouldn't move itself out into how we engage with the world. And I think that's one of the biggest problems of the church now, which I think is a blessing that all of this stuff is coming up because we see we haven't done a great job. We haven't done a good job engaging with people, um, whether it's systems in jail, whether it's the um, school systems, whether it's the government. It's like all of this stuff is systematically built on sin and oppression more times than not. And I get it the most, I don't get it the most, but I understand it deeper than I think most would because I live in Chicago. One of the craziest places to live in where the school systems do not care if you graduate and you cannot read. I know students now who graduated on a second grade reading level, but they keep passing them because they don't care. It's money. And so it's like, what are you going to do when he graduate? What job is he going to get when he can't read the application? Only option he's going to have is to sell drugs. You know what I'm saying? So I'm seeing this stuff. It's like, how can I be a Christian, see that this little boy can't read and that he's graduating and not do something about it? I think I would be doing a disservice to the world. Why am I even here <laughs> if I'm not like working to empower people? And the gospel is a part of that. I want to draw you out of your, your mess and your messiness and show you the God who draws you out of your spiritual mess and your messiness. So... I think what's happening now is a solution. I think the conversations that we're having are great. Um, the blogs being posted, the the small groups and the panels that people are having. I think I think the problem is is that we have not befriended people who are unlike us, and so because of it, we just we're so unable to understand or empathize or even know. I think I feel like I have an understanding that I did not have by living in Chicago. Like I'm friends with Koreans, I'm friends with black people, I'm friends with Nigerian black people who aren't even black like that, Caribbeans, you know what I'm saying? Like all types of different people. So I feel like I have a worldview that's super expanded um, versus when I lived in St. Louis and all I knew was black people. It's like, if all I hang around is black people, all I have conversations with is black people, the way I view life and the world is gonna be skewed. And so I think one of the primary solutions is people 
simply seeking out relationships that are not in their comfort zones. I think there are some places where that might be difficult because I had conversations with people like in Joplin, Missouri, it's like the only black people we know are on the football team. So what do we do about that? It's like, we need to pray because there are black people here. I don't think you've just taken the effort to go look them out or pray, God, draw me to some, you know, other, not even just black people, Latino, Hispanic, um, Asian, like, God, show me where your church is so that I can, and not even your church, but these different races and different colors that you created for your glory, like, draw me to them so I can learn, read a book, watch YouTube. You got world star hip hop for goodness sakes. Don't watch it. It's ratchet. But I'm saying like we have so many resources where you can learn about other cultures, even if you may not have contact with them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think suspicion can exist along with kindness. Um, I think what I've always defaulted to is in first Corinthians 13, it says that love hopes the best. And so I've always tried my best to hope the best about this person. Um, as much as I possibly can, because I do believe that fear has a way of convoluting how we see people. And so I think if I see you as a threat, I'm naturally going to treat you as one. And I think on the other end of the, on the other end of the spectrum, that's exactly what's happening. I think that's why Philando got shot is because he was looked at as a threat even before that police officer never walked up to the car. So when he want to do something little and minor, like get his wallet out, you think he got a gun because you've made up in your mind that this man is a criminal. And so I think, man, like, why don't I do the opposite of what they're doing to me? Let me hope the best about this guy in this uniform and believe him to be a father believe him to be a husband to somebody and treat him with dignity and respect, even if I don't re receive it in return. I think that's easier said than done, but I think the Holy Spirit does give um, power to do that. The Holy Spirit does give power for us to bless those who curse us, for us to turn the other cheek, for us to uh, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, and to love people that don't love us. Like, if we just love people that love us, then I mean, we would be no different than unbelievers. And so I think if the gospel is to inform how I treat people who I might be afraid of, then I simply have to just trust God and love them anyway.